Welcome to the Global Discussion, a discussion with creatives, leaders and thinkers. My name is Simon Hodgkins. Today, really delighted to have Roger Spitz here on the show. Uh, you're very welcome to the Global Discussion. Let's begin, though, Roger, asking you maybe to introduce yourself a little bit. Tell our international audience a little bit about your background, your career progressions, and maybe bring us up to speed with what you're involved in today. So, Roger, you're very welcome. Over to you, my friend. That's great, Simon. Really um, a delight to be on the Global Discussion podcast with you. And so I'm Roger Spurts. I'm born in South Africa, I'm currently living in uh, San Francisco, and most of my professional career is spent in London. I, like many people in sort of hubs or whatever you call them, like London and New York, I spent a lot of my career and started in investment banking. So I was global head of mergers and acquisitions covering technology for one of the global banks and focusing on advising, you know, I guess, C-suite investors and shareholders um, and the boards on the various acquisitions and divestments. And after some time, especially when I reached San Francisco and was here to reinvigorate their business in 2017, I kind of promised myself to get out of the rabbit hole around topics, around change, disruption, complexity. Long story short, that's when I decided to move to to effectively foresight, how to sort of future prepare and make sense of our complex world. I do that through various hats. One is Tech Essential, which is technology and existential, which is a strategic foresight practice. So it's advisory. On the educational front, Disruptive Futures Institute publishes books. We give executive education talks. So it's really kind of education. How do you make sense of this complex, unpredictable world? How do you prepare for it? What frameworks do you use? So that's very much educational content um currently primarily focused on b2b and you know businesses globally um i sit on a few boards we can talk about that from climate to ai i also have a foot on on the bench capital side um, but not executive i try to spend less than 10 percent of my time on on those side of things um and i also spend time with various um organizations which kind of are self-reinforcing in terms of the themes of future preparedness which i which i kind of focus on one of which is world economic forum um where i'm part of the global foresight network that is a lot roger uh, there's a lot going on i'm there, sorry my friend uh, <laughs> there is um a great career trajectory though because you worked at a, a very well known um financial institution uh, in the banking and, and finance industry. And you were there probably just under about 20 odd years, I think, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. And um, you must have seen an awful lot of change over those years. And of course, we've seen uh, big financial institutions come and go. And we've seen some absolute giants being created. We've got new players in that space today. But I was interested when you were telling us a little bit about your background and your career, how you kind of made that almost escape plan to sort of move on to to new things what do you think was driving it at that at that time was that just a personal decision that you you'd done your time in that or you just had this you know interest in doing something else a little bit different what was actually driving that passion roger that's a great question there are a number of things like like often is the case, right? So I think one is I had, as you say, spent kind of two decades in the in the industry and I kind of thought, okay, how much more am I learning? Is that what I want to do for the rest of my life? And you know, things can change either because you choose to do something else or someone else has other plans for you. So um all in all, I was also observing the nature of change was changing. So not to be too gimmicky or to play with words. When I had the opportunity of moving from London to San Francisco in 2017, I promised myself, as I mentioned earlier, that I'd go down the rabbit hole of trying to understand better what was changing. And at a very simplistic level, you know, I was fortunate enough to be advised, well, fortunate or not, but I happened to be advising, you know, people who are kind of very much in the in the decision making, strategic sphere of things, and I just felt that what was keeping people up at night, organizations, wasn't the normal market pressures or competition or playbooks or strategies or buy market share or move to that country. I felt, and you know, M and A is quite strategic. And I just felt that the nature of change was changing. And I went down that rabbit hole, literally. Initially, 
yes, I was always interested in seeing if I could do something else, if I would enjoy something else, if I had the magic idea in Silicon Valley. But ultimately, I didn't. And I just felt that um, by exploring different ecosystems and ideas, at the you know worst case scenario, I'd be a bit more knowledgeable. But actually, it led me onto pathways that I found more um, relevant for, for me to pursue a second kind of wind to, to a career. Um, and that was a kind of combination of, you know, systems thinking, complexity, futures thinking, foresight, understanding better innovation, understanding better emerging technologies. And all of the above somehow gave me a conviction that the assumptions we were making about the world being stable, linear and predictable was not only wrong, which is fine. I mean, we have a Newtonian mechanical simplification of the world, to, you know, which makes sense in a lot of respects. But that that assumption of a linear, predictable, stable, controllable world was actually becoming more costly. To rely on that assumption was an increasingly dangerous and risky thing, whether it was for society, for companies or, or, or countries. And so I kind of got confidence and got a hunch that that was an interesting area for me to professionalize and explore full time, literally professionalizing as a, as a professional futurist, a foresight strategist and started writing books and um, effectively took the you know crazy or, or wise decision to move from investment banking and to do that full time. Um, maybe one point of you know serendipity, which is always interesting, right? Because the best laid plans, as we know. The, I decided to do that a little bit before the pandemic and those were esoteric topics, you know, when you esoteric topics, when you think about, you know, decision making and deep uncertainty, it's it's I mean, I wasn't the only one thinking about it, but it wasn't kind of, you know, the, the convention um, when the pandemic hit and then everything that subsided subsequent to the pandemic suddenly appreciating the complexity, nonlinearity, unpredictability, deep uncertainty of the world were no longer so so alien and actually somehow it gave me more confidence and a lot more interest and visibility in my work. And so it was actually the, the demand side that kind of made me spend time and develop various things in relation to that because they were topical areas of, of high relevance. Yeah, fascinating. And I want to ask you just a, a personal question, if I can, about the type of work the environment and maybe the pressures that go along with that because you weren't just working in it for almost two decades you were at the the heart of innovation really uh when it comes to what's going on in san francisco and you know around the bay silicon valley uh, i know today you still sit on a number of advisory boards you're still involved in venture capital but what was that environment like for people that haven't maybe experienced that because it on one hand it sounds very glamorous on the other hand there's an awful lot of work and pressure involved in that environment am i right in saying that roger yeah listen without a doubt i mean i think today most people and most environments and jobs and the context is challenging so i think we all have our fair share of of pressures of different sorts um m a on one hand, you know, you can either look at it and sort of say, my diamond shoes are too tight or my kangal is too salty. And then a lot of the world will sort of think you're being a little bit, you know, yeah, it's tough, but, you know, these are decently paid jobs and, you know, it's a privilege to, to do them. Um, it doesn't mean they aren't hard. So um, the pressures, if you're asking, and again, once again, for the many privileges that go with that, um, are you dealing with constituents, both internal and your clients, that are extremely demanding, and rightly so. You know, they're very significant financial um, implications and strategy at cost, and uh, you're kind of supporting those decisions in terms of making a deal, not making a deal, on what terms, what value, etc. So that's number one. Number two, um, the pressures of time and that are, are quite significant. Um, these are demanding jobs at all levels. As you move up the career, you're moving more and more towards marketing and supervising it, execution. You're traveling four, five, six, seven days a week sometimes. Um, and you're, you know, it, it might seem exciting to have, you know, lunches and breakfasts in different parts of the world with CEOs and the like, but they're also very demanding. So to make an impact and to be relevant with those constituents are you know, requires some kind of um, preparation and, and inspiration and a bit of luck as well. Um, and then 
maybe the, the the sort of third or fourth, third point, I guess, is that you know there's a lot of turnover in these jobs. They're very kind of demand led, result led. Um, you need to generate the deals. A lot of the deals you work on don't materialize. So there's an element that's simply frustrating. It's almost like Sisyphus. You know, you push the ball up and then the deals flop, or you get a deal, or you pitch a deal a lot and another bank gets it. They offer no silver medals. So unlike other parts of investment banking, where you know if you're raising a, a bond, there are ten banks in a syndicate or an IPO. In M and A, it's often an exclusive advisor. You're either advising or you're not. Um, so anyway, long story short fascinating period of my life very privileged learned extraordinary great exposure to all kinds of aspects but like many things not without its kind of quirks and, and pressures for sure thank you for sharing that roger now uh, a lot of people listen to these episodes but a lot of people also watch them and for people that are listening only uh, you have a nice disruptive futures institute logo behind you and you've mentioned this already and I think at the time recording, you're heading for about five years since you sort of found, you know, the, the, you're the founding chair of this. And as this sort of global think tank, um, can you maybe unpack Disruptive Futures a little bit more uh, and tell us a little bit more about the the work that's involved there? Yeah, so the the fundamental aspect is really the scope, I guess, which is what, what do we mean by disruptive futures? And effectively, we mean discontinuity. We mean that change is a constant. We mean that to assume that things will continue as they are or in a similar way is, is maybe dangerous to inform decision-making from that. So our starting point is that change is a constant. Things are uncertain and predictable. Incidentally, and we can unpack that if you wish, Subsequently, that's not necessarily a negative because it actually gives you a lot of agency. The opposite of things being pre, you know, would be that things are predetermined. So I actually don't think it's necessarily a negative, but it does require a particular type of sense making. What do you do when things are unpredictable, complex? What does that even mean? What does it look like? What frameworks can support you to inform decision making, to make sense of that world? Um, and so the Disruptive Futures Institute has a remit, whether it's for individuals or today we're slightly more focused on, on organizations and corporates, but, but fundamentally we're moving towards, you know, supporting the entire world in, in our own way to appreciate what the nature of our world is, to appreciate how to make sense of that complex, unpredictable world, and to have tools to, to, to navigate through it, to make decisions, and even to create value and impact um, despite those characteristics. It's primarily educational. That includes books we write. I have a new, you know, we have four big volumes called The Definitive Guide to Thriving on Disruption. I have a new book coming out, um, Disrupt with Impact, in September. We give executive education courses. And we record podcasts like with you, um, Simon, quite, quite frequently. Um, articles, we have a full executive education program, workshops from Brazil to Asia to, you know, Canada, US, I was in Europe for most of June. Um, and they cover topics of really underlying drivers of change. So we're not trying to kind of quote unquote bullshit bingo our way to the next trend or to the next type of AI. We're really looking at what are the fundamental drives of change? Of course, that includes technologies, it includes AI, it includes climate, it includes societal, it includes many things. Um, but we're not trying to be, you know, the thickest, biggest trend report or what have you. We're really looking at things that are more fundamental, how they connect, what are the next order implications and how to manage that. Thank you, Roger. And was it a strategic decision to always have books as part of this journey? Because I think we're on book five now, if I'm right. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of sort of think tanks around the world... There's obviously papers and there's normally reports. And as you say, they get thicker each year and the covers get glossier. But was the writing of books always part of this strategy um, that you set out with? I love the question and you'll see why in a second. Um, the, the books are kind of support of other ways of, of education, right? Videos and talks and, and executive programs and that. And I actually started off when I kind of left investment banking a few years back, thinking of writing just a kind of more conventional 200 page or whatever on, on change and that. And that's when the pandemic hit. And so I got asked more and more because of the topics I was focusing on to give talks and then to do half day board strategy workshops and then to give 
to do an executive program. And so my kind of book, little by little, became case studies and checklists and frameworks, and some were my own and some were building on the, you know, the amazing work of others. And as I started putting that together, it became more of a system of educational content for the topics which I described earlier. And so I kind of got together with about 12 people and in particular, an amazing girl called Lydia Zwin, a Brazilian journalist who's very involved in some of these topics and that. And I decided, you know what, instead of writing a kind of more conventional book, I'm actually going to write slightly arrogantly, but something called The Definitive Guide to Thriving on Disruption. They're four volumes. They're pretty substantive, um, at least in, in, in width and that. And they're meant to be kind of what's evergreen in terms of not getting too out of date. I mean, of course, things will change, but the fundamentals are evergreen. And the volume one is really how do we make sense of this complex, unpredictable world? Pre volume two is what are the frameworks and tools for this uncertain world? Volume three is beta your life. What does it mean for you as an individual? It covers topics like education, transhumanism, all kinds of things, work and money. Volume four, what does it mean for you as a business? So it's like, what's happening? Frameworks to deal with it meaning for an individual, meaning for business. And those are four volumes. And that basically is what I call the mothership, the system of content. And then we curate from that, we update it, because I also have my finger on the pulse with actual real world advisory work. It helps inform the executive education with real case studies and things that aren't out of date and that. And then the fifth book is kind of like, just because there's demand and it's a different factor. In a way, it's my first real more conventional commercial trade book. The others are more sort of supporting the educational side of, a, of an institute. Um, so, but none of them are meant to be kind of trend reports or whatever. They're meant to be, you know, practical tools for, for the things we've described. And whether they're effective or not, you'll have to ask people who, who dived into them, you know, but I would suggest they are, but that's the feedback we get, but hey. <laughs> no, I think it's a great, a great approach, obviously. And the new book, uh, it's due out in a short number of months, I think, at the time of mm -hmm. recording today. And it's called Disrupt with Impact. Um, and it isn't just about achieving success in this unpredictable world sort of framework. But you, you're also going to be diving into the frameworks here, aren't you, and building sort of confidence in plans that people have. Am I right in saying that, Roger? You are. And one of the big areas I'm kind of trying to spend my time um, is to move from just the idea of being future prepared and being able to inform decision making and uncertainty to also think about how do you drive transformational change in complex systems, whether that's a climate tech startup, whether it's your own life, whether it's society or whatever. What And, and you know, again, building on people have been focused on this for, for decades or years, um, as well as my own ideas. But there are some levers that are more effective for change. There's some that are harder, but more effective. There's some that are ineffective. There's certain ways of doing things when you're dealing with complex systems, which is our society and, and world. Um, and so the disruptive impact is really that Disrupt is not meant to be the Silicon Valley, technocentric bullshit bingo thing, if I'm allowed to say that, if not just beep it. <laughs> but disrupt is really just meant to be that the status quo isn't working. There's too many challenges, whether it's climate, society, whatever it is, technology, the status quo is is, is probably going to lead the world into a kind of dead end or worse. Um, so you need change, whether it's, you know, to survive, whether it's to do things differently, whether it's to solve our complex challenges for society, whatever it is. And you want to do it with impact because not because you shuffle paper or write checks or do whatever that is necessarily effective. So it's really, you know, how do you for future prepare, but in a way that can drive change in an effective way, as opposed to just change for the sake of change. Um, and that's broader than just technology or the sort of more Silicon Valley centric, you know, use of disruption. But that's, that's probably the biggest contribution of the latest book is that for the past year or two, I've been really spending a lot of time with organizations and, and research and, and work, just thinking about formalizing that um, aspect of, of driving change itself, you know? Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that view. And I think driving impact in that sense, as opposed to the BS bingo card sense that we were referring yeah. to a moment ago, I think that's very, very powerful positioning. I I heard a, a, an investor speaking recently who was referencing the 
uh, AI being a little like refrigeration. And refrigeration was a great invention, but Coca-Cola built a fortune on the back of it by using refrigeration. And uh, it's kind of as though, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, because everybody goes down the AI rabbit hole, um, Silicon Valley probably more than most, and everybody's baked in AI into everything they're doing to either raise money or sell product. But do you think we're moving to a situation where businesses are starting to think more about the impact that they're having, about the execution of how they build with some of these new tools, as opposed to just the sort of headlines that we're all reading? Or, or, or is there still some education to be done here, Roger? So I, I'm, I'm going to have to take a few shortcuts given given time. I mean, I don't mind, but just for your for the listeners and that. But the, the, I'll, I'll give you one or two kind of snippets and I'm happy to expand if you wish. Um, the first one is just to quote something I have in my in my latest book, which is AI seems to be the answer to everything, even though we're not quite sure what the question might be. Um, but uh, no, I think the short answer is is no. I think people don't really care much about, I mean, in terms of the organizations and the technology players don't really care much about anything other than value creation, right? And and you might argue that insofar as that's the kind of constitution today you was, you know, like it or not, you have shareholders and the objective of the company is still to maximize value. So the reality is that for the one or two attempts to move towards stakeholder um value and and that the reality is that in the end none of that has kind of really been a kind of um real lever or obligation or whatever to to a large extent so sadly that's the case the second thing i would say is that beyond the companies just focusing on value creation for ai is i find that unfortunately a lot of the debate is focused on some important topics but that shouldn't be limited to that one you know ethics and all that are, are absolutely phenomenally critical topic so that's fine and it should be the case as to whether the discussions and the resolutions are, are kind of satisfaction or not is another matter but a lot of the debate otherwise is kind of between a sort of broad dichotomy of utopia or dystopia and the dystopia is you know existential risk but as defined in a very specific manner of human extension and so once you're kind of going through these sort of false dichotomies and quite extreme you're missing out a lot of the implications and that's what we unpack quite heavily, I'll give you the sort of the one minute element on, on it, which I think is missing to the debate, what we call kind of tech essentialism, which is existentialism 2.0, which is what happens when humans no longer have exclusivity to decision making, what happens to your freedom, agency and choice, that is an existential risk, even though it's not human extinction. And what happens to de-skilling when, you know, when AI is moving up the decision making value chain, where humans are less capable of understanding and processing complexity where you're delegating decision-making um, to machines. And effectively, not only are machines learning more and humans stagnating, but we're declining. So it's even worse than the Ricardo effect in economics in a sense. Um, and that has ramifications on, on education, what it should be on the future of humanity, on on you know not to mention potential for mass unemployment don't get me wrong um we use disruption and change in a neutral manner so it's not necessarily good or bad it's not that ai is terrible or ai is good i understand the you know the the, the miracles of medicine and other areas that can arise from technology and and the reality is that that duality those contradictions tensions and paradoxes cohabitate you know you can use you know I forget, it was one of the founders of uh, of Intel, right, is a, is a piece of uh, metal, good or bad, or steel, good or bad, or, you know, if you make a weapon out of it, it's probably not good if you're using it. If you're making a knife to cut fruit or whatever, maybe it's not a bad thing. So, you know, fundamentally, these things can be neutral, but obviously, if the debates are the wrong debates, and if the development of them has limited safeguards and has one primary objective of value creation, for whom, for the shareholders, um, then clearly with things that are kind of quite substantive, like uh, technology or AI, the ramifications are, are are sort of beyond what we can kind of cover in this podcast. Although I'm happy to unpack further if you wish to, if you feel this time or what have you. I, but... I, I think we could talk for weeks on end and we're definitely going to have to get you back to unpack some of these a little <laughs> more. Uh, I don't want to run out of time though. And I do want to ask you about... Um, your recent involvement 
at the Global Foresight Network. People may be unfamiliar with what that is, but it, I know you're in Geneva recently with the World Economic Forum. Um, and that is, uh, I know you, you spoke at that. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the purpose of that is? And uh, maybe just give us a little bit of insight to your experience there uh, over the last number of days. Yeah, so the initiative is is really to sort of help with the levers of the organization, the World Economic Forum, and, and it's kind of 50, 60 members of the Global Foresight Network, basically to have a multiplier effect to support future preparedness. At its simple core, that's that's what it is. The people attending included, you know, academics, practitioners, um, organizations, you know, from AstraZeneca to AXA and insurance to, to different organizations, as well as institutional um, or government. You have, you know, countries that are very advanced in thinking about future preparedness from a policy and legislation perspective, like Finland, Singapore, who had this sort of foresight teams, but that kind of feed directly into the prime minister's office. Um, you had people in the US who kind of briefed the White House and, and the president and to think about the next 10, 20, 30 years, people had a foresight for the OECD or, or um, uh, 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 NATO and, and other organizations. So the interesting thing is that people had a different vantage point, but ultimately we we're focusing on the same thing, which is foresight and future preparedness. I think the net net is really, um, you know, a realization of the degree of deep unpredictability we we live in. So any, whether, you know, it's at societal, individual level organizations that are not really understanding that the nature of change is changing, that the asymmetries and nonlinearity has implications in terms of outcomes. It, it can also be for the for the good. We talked about many things like the UN Summit for the Future and some initiatives on climate where you can have virtuous tipping points as well. But there are a lot of headwinds with, with negative risks. They are somewhat existential from climate to AI or nuclear. Um, yeah, human made, so they're within our control, which in a way makes it makes it more sort of sad in a sense. Um, but fundamentally, it's really, you know, thinking about the multipliers we all have to, to reinforce future preparedness, thinking about the importance of resiliency, Think about the importance of education, of justice. Different parts of the world are affected in different ways by um, by some of these events. And the most important thing, takeaway, which is again why we focus on the broad underlying drives of change and the unpredictability, is how things intersect and interact, and that creates further uncertainty. So you can't, you know, just look at individual risks or, or features or change in an isolated manner. They're self-reinforcing, and again, sometimes it's for the best, and they're virtuous things. Often it isn't. That makes a lot of sense, Roger. And um, I think that unpredictability that you're talking about there, um, the interesting is when you sort of look at that through the lens of creating impact in the, the sense that we were talking about earlier. And, you know, people, businesses, governments, countries being ready to make the necessary changes. And also that maybe, maybe the... Uh, the leveling of the playing field maybe on a global level whether it comes to technology or ai or whether it's lots of different things it seems like there's an awful lot of change coming down the path rapidly anyway um so it is fascinating to get some insights from you about that global foresight network so thank you for sharing that um I, the next six 12 months you've obviously got the new book coming out but you sit on you know you, you're still involved in the vc world you've obviously got the Disruptive Futures Institute, you're a busy man. Uh, what are you thinking about? What's on your mind right now when you look forward and you think about the next 6, 12, 24 months? What's on your roadmap? What's on your horizon? What's keeping you up at night, Roger? So I, the good thing is that I'm quite aligned with what I feel is important for the world and which is motivating for me. So I'm not pretending to be, you know, Mother Theresa or, or something I'm not, but I trying to find a balance where things I'm doing are, are motivating or interesting for me and potentially of relevance and impactful more broadly. Um, while I do have different hats and things going on, they are quite self-reinforcing. So they focus ultimately on, on foresight, future preparedness, building resiliency. The 
Um, we have a few initiatives specifically in climate for our Disruptive Fusion Institute's Sustainability and Climate Academy. I'm in Brazil for a few weeks in August. I'm on the board of the first Brazilian carbon credit certifier. The voluntary carbon market is something which is unfortunately a bit dysfunctional and, uh, and problematic. But there are some actors that are doing very interesting things. So I'm spending time um, with, with a company in Brazil. We're trying to rethink the voluntary carbon market in our own way. Um, the the demand for some of the things we're doing is broadening beyond just corporates and organizations. So I've been extremely fortunate to be busy and and scaling on the sort of business side, but I do see demand from individuals. So I'm looking forward, you know, within the six six nine months to starting, you know, cohort based courses, which kind of be more access to individuals who who might not be doing the executive education. Um, probably launching some digital courses and kind of trying to to move to to sort of the consumer side as well, partly because from a business perspective, it's a big, it's also a big market and that, but also genuinely, I think these are topics that are important and I've always tried to make them democratized and available through through our work for whoever's interested in them. Um, and then the final point maybe is that I'm trying to also think of different form factors to make it less painful than just, you know, courses and books and that. So I've tried it some improv and maybe stand up comedy and I'm kind of, I know it's very difficult to do humor today, A, because it's difficult to be funny and, and that, and B, because in California you get arrested for anything that could remotely be funny just because of the way the world is going and sensitivities. But having said that, I do still believe in humanity and the ability to to explore different ways of of sharing um, different ideas and that, that, that are kind of, um, yeah, less binary than the more conventional approaches. A true mixed media approach to things then in every sense of the word. Um, and finally, Roger, then, you know, when you are talking uh, about these topics, it's such, it's such a broad thing. We, we we're never going to cover it in one episode. But is there anything that you want to maybe expand on or maybe even something that we haven't mentioned that you want to leave as maybe a parting thought for our worldwide listeners and viewers of this episode? You know, we touched upon it briefly, but I think ultimately it, you know, the most important takeaway for me, and I just kind of think about it more and more, is really the importance of education. And that's the strongest lever, the most difficult one for, for building resiliency, relevancy, Um and within that, there's a subset around how you see the world and the assumptions you make about the world. Never assume um, the idea that in Zen Buddhism and Eastern philosophy of uh, Shoshin, beginner's mind. Um, and I and I also use an innovation context, you know, B-School or what have you. But I think that that idea um, of constantly learning, relearning, unlearning, that idea of, of agency we have on, on our beingness, um, that idea that uncertainty is actually thanks to that, that things are not predetermined and, and you know, not assuming that things are linear, predictable and controllable, um, but that it doesn't necessarily have to be scary if you have the right tools and mindset for that. I think the Western world doesn't do itself justice in putting itself in a box and perfectionism and what's right and wrong and avoiding mistakes and change, you know, in Eastern philosophy, the idea of transience and change being a constant, the different kind of relationship with them, um, with things, which I think can be helpful to to manage times of a uh, of change. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, thank you for for adding that. Um, now, look, there's so much we haven't got to. We haven't really talked in depth about a lot of the um, boards that you sit on. You know, there's the educational and faculty elements of what you do. Um, and th th there's a lot going on and as well in terms of your uh, advice through uh, uh, your organization for AI and uh, you know the how, how that comes together between humans and AI but there's a lot going on so I suppose last question is if people want to actually find out more about all this great work that you're doing Roger where do we want to send people to is it a website is it your LinkedIn profile where's the best place for people to go to if they're watching or listening to this episode. No, that's great. Thanks. So I think the best is probably just to follow Disruptive Futures Institute um, on LinkedIn, on the website, and not to kind of want to push books, but for those who find it relevant and want to have a 
the book, um, we do have the four guidebooks and there's the new book, Disrupt with Impact, which will be published in September um, globally, initially in English. Um, but I think for people who, yeah, if, they, if you follow the Disruptive Futures Institute, we're on Instagram, we're on LinkedIn and various other things, um, you'll quickly find also podcasts and YouTube and other things if you're interested. And uh, we do aspire to ramp up how much is available for free and democratized for those who want bite size and different forms. So that's probably the easiest. Well, that's perfect and that brings us nicely to the end of our discussion today here on the global discussion so thanks to everybody who's been watching listening to our discussions here today make sure that you follow like subscribe do everything i need you to do to help support the show and of course go and check out everything that roger's involved in it really is a wealth of information check out those four volumes and of course the new book that's coming out uh, go and grab grab a copy of that for sure. But Roger, thank you so much indeed for being on the show. I hope people join me again here for some more discussions with creatives and leaders and thinkers just like Roger. But thanks, Roger. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. Likewise, Simon. Thanks for the exchanges and the richness of the of the topics.